Covering a half acre with hanging flowers, the oldest known wisteria in Japan is the centerpiece of this brilliantly pastel-colored flower park. Located in Tochiki, Japan, just over an hour train ride from Tokyo, is Ashikaga Flower Park. The park spans 23 acres and is home to more than 350 wisterias and other flowers. The colors vary depending on the flowering season from pinks and purples to yellows and whites. Some features of the park include the wisteria tunnel and floating gardens, but the pride and joy of Ashikaga Flower Park is the Great Miracle Wisteria. The 140-year-old sprawling tree is located in a place of pride, right in the center of the park. After nightfall, the site is lit up so these draping flowers can be seen at all hours. The vivid yellow wisteria begins blooming at the start of May and is the only one of its kind in Japan. The park is a year-round attraction with seasonal plants that creates an ever-changing sense of magnificence as nature puts on a show. Some people who come to this house, it looks like something out of a romantic magical fairy tale. But this romantic magical fairy tale really is our home. I'm Jasmine. I'm Simon. And we live out in the Pacelli Hills in West Wales. We're part of a wide community that spreads over the whole region and the local area of people learning to tread softly on the earth. When we decided to settle down and make a permanent home, it seemed fairly clear to us we much preferred to be in the countryside. And I did like the sort of magical element of, you know, the idea of fairies and myth and stuff like that. We built a small, simple, modest house out of the things that were around us, out of the things that we could easily get from waste and from the natural world rather than going and buying things. This is where we store our firewood to keep us warm through the winter. It took us about two months, so we've used stones, mud, clay, wood. We brought in some straw bales and used quite a lot of those. And it cost us around about two or three thousand pounds. And the big house, um, Simon's finishing it to a very high standard, so it will have a lot of longevity, it will last for a long time, generations. And we're either using recycled materials, natural materials, or things that we've grown available from this piece of land. This is my greenhouse. You put the food in relationship to the house and to the water and to the landscape, then instantly in come the fellows, the birds and the insects. Our dirty water can feed the plants. Our need for shelter can give nice shelter for other animals to come and live. And we really can live in a way which is sympathetic to the rest of what's going on in nature. This is my workshop. My commute to work goes a bit like this. Out of the front door, dodging between the flowers and maybe picking a few berries off the bush on the way past for a little snack until I get to my workshop. At the end of every day, I could sit back and see the thing that we've made and know where the piece of wood had come from. I mean, the first night in a house that you've made with your own friends, and with your own hands, in exactly the way you want it to be, is an absolutely magical one. Rising out of the Tuscan hills are some colourful and unusual figures inspired by tarot cards. The Tarot Park is located in Tuscany, a few hours outside of Rome. The park took 20 years to complete and includes 22 figures from the tarot deck. There's a sphinx that leads to a golden skeleton riding a blue horse over a green sea. This represents death. The hanged man can be found inside one of the sparkling grottos suspended from the ceiling. And one of the most bizarre figures is the oracle, which is a hollow-eyed figure surrounded and covered by snakes. 
The eccentric artist who created this garden was Nikki de Saint Fall. In the early 1950s, Nikki was committed to an asylum and believes it was art that eventually healed her. She wanted to create a place that would have the same healing effect on those who visited. The park opened in 1998, just four years before Nikki's death. In her own words, she dreamt of building a garden that would be a dialogue between sculpture and nature. A place to dream in. Limulan Jun is a curious place. Very curious. And it all comes from the mind of a clown. My name is Slava. I'm a clown. I live everywhere. Like a spirit. Два главных, две главные силы цирка – это э, удивление и восхищение. Слава is an avant-garde performance artist and one of the most recognizable clowns in the world. He grew up in communist Russia and spent his youth idolizing Charlie Chaplin. Slava revolutionized the art of clowning, moving it out of the circus and onto the stage. И потом мне надоело работать в театре, и я решил сооснавать мировую академию дураков, которая сейчас имеет резиденцию в этом саду. А у нас много красивых проектов, а сегодня мы решили, что самая простая тема – пикник. The Moulin John is Slava's creative space, where he and his family and his Academy of Fools host open events, run workshops and rehearsals, all in his surreal wonderland. First, I love life, I love people, especially artists. I feel very comfortable in them, comfortable, harmonious. I love myself in the art. And the more I am around him, the more I can do it too. And it's not important that you do it with a hat, or you wear a hat, or you wear a hat, or you will be a clown. Just when you create something, you create something that you didn't have in this world, there is a realization of your destiny. For a castle straight out of a fairy tale, look no further than the Alcazar of Segovia. Located in central Spain, the Alcazar of Segovia is one of the country's most visited and distinctive landmarks. Built in the 12th century, the Alcazar has served many functions over the years, a fortress, a royal palace, a state prison, an artillery college, and most recently, a museum and military archive. However, its most famous function could arguably be that it served as an inspiration in some of the most iconic Disney films. The similarities between Sergovia and Cinderella can be found in the building's brick facade, turrets, and location, perched high above the neighboring countryside. Walt Disney also went on to reproduce Segovia as the Queen's Castle in Snow White, with it appearing in the film in its almost exact form. If you can make it up more than 150 stairs to the top of the tower, you will be rewarded with stunning views fit for a queen. Sword making has always been an esoteric endeavor. 
There's never been a great number of people doing it. You have this transformation of raw material, the alteration of nature, and in the end, you get something that just exudes power. This is Valyrian steel. It's my father's sword. The ancient swords on Game of Thrones, forged with Valyrian steel, were stronger and lighter than any other weapon. No one knows how they were made. In the real world, over a thousand years ago in Viking lands, there was also a series of special swords with mysterious origins. And a blacksmith in Wisconsin tried to make one. This is an Ulfbert sword. From about 850 to maybe early 1200s, in Viking controlled lands, you had a sword that had a name inlay called Wolfbert which roughly translates to uh, wolf tooth or wolf bear. It's a, a word of power. There are only 350 known Ulfbert swords. Forged with a quality of steel that didn't emerge in Europe for another thousand years, no one knows exactly how they were made. I think I've come fairly close, or at least a pretty good rendition of how they made those blades. Steel is a pretty special material. We know a great deal about it, and we know almost nothing about it. So with the Ulfbert, you have a mythical steel mirrored in the Game of Thrones where you have this steel that no one's able to reproduce, that black Valerian steel. Sword making technology still holds a bit of alchemy, a bit of mysticism in it. We want to believe that there's something that we can't understand. There's still mysteries in steel.